Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this episode of Defense News Weekly, advances in some of the U.S. military's high altitude defense systems. Find out how experts are working on improving missile intercepts. Plus, how do National Guard troops from all over the country coordinate with local agencies when arriving on scene? We talk to a Top Guard official looking for a calm solution. Also, the end of Roe versus Wade. How will it impact members of the military? Our team of reporters and editors is back to break down some of the biggest recent stories of the week. We've got those stories and more on tap this week, so don't go away. It's the latest in news and analysis from the Pentagon to the platoon, here on Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. I'm Andrea Scott. First up this week, the Patriot Missile System is a vaunted defense platform with a trusted record in combat, knocking down scuds in Iraq, among other missions. But Patriot batteries are only designed to go so far. So what's next? How about a rocket that goes Mach 8 and can take out ballistic missiles as they re-enter from orbit? It's the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense System, and Todd South has the news on the latest evolution of the THAAD. Anti-missile and air defense systems. If you're a soldier on the ground, there's one thing you really, really want to get your support system to get right. That's knocking missiles out of the sky before they can get to you. You'll take it all day, every day. And pushing that capability forward recently, Army Air Defenders made the first remote launch of one of their most powerful systems outside of a testing scenario. Soldiers with the E-3 Air Defense Battery fired off the Ballistic Missile Defense Terminal High Altitude Air Defense or THAAD launch in the Pacific. The E-Battery soldiers worked with a host of Air Force wings, squadrons, and signaliers from the 307th Expeditionary Signal Battalion enhanced out of Hawaii. The soldiers and airmen took the THAAD vehicle-mounted system from Guam to Rota, an island in the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands, by way of the C-17 Globemaster III airplane. The exercise, called Talon Lightning, included aircraft maintenance, air transport, logistical, and cyberspace support specialists from the 715th Air Mobility Operations Group. It's the first time that troops and airmen have loaded up a THAAD, flown it to a battlefield, and fired it remotely in a single exercise. So what is a THAAD? The THAAD defends against short, medium, and intermediate range ballistic missiles as they descend or re-enter the atmosphere. The solid fuel, single-stage, 2,000-pound rocket can fly as high as 150 kilometers, or 93 miles, and reach speeds as fast as Mach 8.2, which is 10,000 kilometers per hour. Following the Scud missile attacks on the U.S.-led Coalition 1991 Persian Gulf War, the Army began work on developing an air defense system for just such threats. The first test flight of the THAAD system by Lockheed Martin happened in late 2005. First produced for fielding in 2008, the THAAD system eventually fell under the DoD's Missile Defense Agency, but with a shift to more peer and near-peer threats, air defense has taken on more of a role and a focus for Army units than it has in recent wars. Last year, Lockheed Martin announced the delivery of its 600th system in the 15-year production history. Now, a lot of people might confuse the THAAD with a well-known Patriot system. The Patriot Defense Missile System is a surface-to-air missile system that uses radar tracking to detect and then fire on incoming threats. It was produced in the 1970s and fielded in the early 1980s. It has been used to destroy SCUD missiles, drones, and enemy aircraft. The two systems together, Patriot and THAAD, have been called the Army's bread and butter for air defense. They're both deployed currently side-by-side -side in South Korea to defend against aerial and other missile threats posed by the North Korean military. But tying the two systems together is one step in a larger Army and even DoD-wide program to link all sensors and all shooters. This folds within the Army's multi-domain operations doctrine, which calls for a network sensing and shooting platforms. The aim is to have a network that can detect any threat in the defined region and pass data instantaneously to the right shooting system, whether that's an F-35, a Marine rocket artillery team, or a Patriot or THAAD launcher, just to hit that threat. 
but it's not been entirely friendly skies for the air defense shooting community. Defense News reported in 2019 that the then director of the U.S. Missile Defense Agency was fighting the transfer of the THAAD capability entirely out of the agency to the Army. That transfer has been on an ongoing debate for at least a decade at that time. And while the Army operates the system, the Missile Defense Agency handles its development and modernization. But when the Army established its Features Command and cross-functional teams to tackle modernization a few years ago, it put a high priority, basically top of the list, on long-range persistent fires and air defense modernization. But who controls those top-level decisions is kind of up to the purse string custodians in Congress. Now on the ground, the work falls to the soldiers and the airmen to make that tech work right. And the remote firing from Guam to the island of Rota gave tactical and theater-level commanders a new way to distribute air defense across a wide range. And that's one step in an umbrella of sensors and shooters that the Army's after. This has been Todd South reporting for Military Times. Thanks, Todd. And in other news from around the military, Jim Mattis may be a monk no more as he recently got married, with one of his ceremonies being performed by an Elvis impersonator, no less. The legendary retired Marine General and former Defense Secretary has been known for his solitary warfighting nature. But this month, the retired four-star first tied the knot with Christina Lamasny, a physicist, on the banks of the Columbia River, and later in Vegas with Elvis. Politico reported that, unsurprisingly, the couple met in a bar. Up next, it's this week's edition of Defense Dollars. The Pentagon has announced that Raytheon Technologies and Northrop Grumman have each won contracts to continue developing hypersonic weapons interceptors. Each contract so far is worth some $61 million. In November 2021, the Missile Defense Agency chose two companies, in addition to Lockheed Martin, to design the Glide Phase Interceptor for regional hypersonic missile defense. The interceptors are intended to counter a hypersonic weapon during its glide phase of flight. That's a challenge because hypersonic missiles can travel more than five times the speed of sound. And unlike intercontinental ballistic missiles, hypersonics can be maneuvered. That makes it hard to predict its route and kill it. The interceptors will be designed to fit into the U.S. Navy's current ballistic missile defense destroyers. The Senate recently approved a new deputy commander of Army Futures Command. Major General Ross Kaufman is currently the head of U.S. Army Combat Vehicle Modernization. Kaufman received his third star and will take over as deputy of a command that was formed less than five years ago. The next commander has not yet been nominated after its first chief, General Mike Murray, retired in 2021. California-based Viasat will experiment with 5G to support U.S. Marine Corps operations and a broader command and control application after securing a research award from the Pentagon. Viasat will explore how 5G networking and related technologies can come together to support some operations over the next four years. Specifically, they will support expeditionary advanced base operations, which include the need for long-range precision fires, refueling, rearming, and reconnaissance. Viasat provides satellite and networking capabilities, and this is the third award as part of the Pentagon's $600 million 5G research initiative. A Viasat spokesperson said that the Phase One awards are worth some $10 million. When we come back, a conversation with a top National Guard official about how the Guard wants to tackle communications challenges. And later, analysis of some of the biggest stories of the week from our team of top reporters. Welcome back. The National Guard faces a unique challenge when it arrives at a mission. How do you take units from all over the country and get them to communicate with police, fire, disaster, or other local agency officials who have their own equipment and frequencies? During a recent webcast, reporter Colin Demarest found out how the Guard is tackling communications challenges. Today, we will look at the communication needs of the National Guard, its existing critical infrastructure, and what the Guard needs to ensure that every state's Guard has the communication resources, equipment, and training it needs to communicate effectively in any deployment scenario. 
looking to the to the future, what what, what are you eyeing gear wise, infrastructure wise? What do you need to do your job well, or what does the guard need to do its job well? So a good question. We we have an initiative going right now. We're partner with the uh, headquarters department of the army. It's called Bring Your Own Approved Device. So it, it in in a in a typical uh, state, right? We don't all of our guardsmen. Uh, Unfortunately, they may not have government furnished devices, you know, mobile cell phones, iPads. And so we have this uh, uh, initiative and we're in a phase three pilot right now where you'll be able to basically uh, use your personal device uh, that's, that's actually uh, you know, sanctioned by, by uh, the DOD uh, CIO uh, cybersecurity office um, where you can get information, you can uh, get all of your, you can do video, you can do everything that you can do on desktop in your office on your personal uh, mobile device, whether it's a cell phone, whether it's an iPad, uh, whether it's a, a civilian uh, computer. Uh, this is crucial because it, it cuts down time when we're planning for mobile, uh, mobilization. Uh, it, it, you're able to coordinate in between uh, your drills, between call up, uh, and it gives you uh, capability uh, that you would need, like if you were actually on duty in your office or, or you know, using a government furnished device. So it sounds like Bring Your Own Device has been successful, but I'm guessing there were some hiccups or hurdles to get to that point. What was that well, like? Well, yeah, so we're, we're going into phase three testing. Uh, obviously, if, uh, we've, we've gone through phase two. What that really means is a small sample size to, to actually uh, kind of test this device. Uh, I, I was one of the participants. I had it on my uh, personal mobile device and I had everything I need, Office 365. I was able to do Teams. And so it was very successful. Um, again, we, we team with uh, Headquarters Department of the Army and the DOD CIO uh, to go through this uh, uh, pilot program. Now we're going into phase three, which is a larger sample size. And, it, and the, the pilot is, is, a, is uh, about a year. And so, you know, once we get through that and we, we feel very confident that we will be successful based on uh, the phase two, we can go into production. But this will be a game changer. When we come back, tips on how to save from our financial expert. And later, how the Roe versus Wade abortion decision might impact members of the military. Welcome back. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack gives you some top tips on how to save cash. Military life comes with some big responsibilities. At the same time, it offers opportunities for growth, not just professionally, but financially as well. Whether you're just starting or have been in for years, it's never too early or too late to develop the kind of habits that make for great money management and building wealth. You probably know your service gets you discounts and perks. But did you know that many retailers and restaurants don't always broadcast their discounts? Always ask and show your military ID whenever you're pulling out your wallet. You might just save some money. And speaking of saving, that's how you build wealth. Save, 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 which means you can't spend, spend, spend. Overspending gets you in trouble and can even cost you in fees and late charges. So don't spend more than you earn. Always know where your money is going and stick to a smart budget. Your military paycheck makes it easier for you than in other jobs because housing and other costs are sometimes paid for, and you have opportunities to make extra money while on active duty. Be smart. Stack those bonuses and specialty pay. Put that money on auto deposit into your savings account, and you'll see just how fast a cushion builds. Make the most of your military life and your paycheck, and you'll set yourself up for success professionally and financially. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next week. To get more military and defense world coverage, navigate on over to Army, Navy, Air Force, and MarineCorpsTimes.com and DefenseNews.com.
And if you want to know things earlier than other people, sign up for our early bird brief. And make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. And when we come back, analysis of some of the top stories from the week, including how the Supreme Court's abortion decision may affect military members. Welcome back. The Supreme Court's rescission of a constitutional right to abortion has sent shockwaves around the country. But what does it mean for military members and civilians working under the Department of Defense? To look into that story and more from this week, Military Times and Defense News' top correspondents got together to get behind the headlines. Welcome back to the Military Times Reporters Roundtable, where we bring you the news behind the week's biggest headlines. I'm your host, Military Times Capitol Hill Bureau Chief Leo Shane, and I'm joined in studio today by a pair of my Pentagon colleagues, Megan Myers, Pentagon Bureau Chief for the Military Times, and Joe Gould, Defense News Pentagon Expert. Welcome to both of you. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Let's dive right into the biggest story of the last week, which is abortion. In the last few days since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, which legalized abortion across America, numerous states have moved to outlaw the procedure. Now, that's caused concerns among some service members and advocates who say that women stationed in those states will be forced to give up their health care rights just because of their military obligations. A number of lawmakers in Capitol Hill have called for Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin to find ways around these new state laws, perhaps providing travel stipends, flexible medical leave, something to the women who request some sort of help on this. Megan, what's been the Pentagon's response so far? Where, where do we stand on this? So the Pentagon's first step was to basically put out a message to the force saying we are taking your rights and your reproductive health seriously. We are going to go through our policies and you know, tell, tell you what we know now and what we may want to change in the future. Um, the second thing that they did is say that there is going to be continuity of care for the types of abortions that uh, the military already covers um, and for the travel that's associated with them. And the issue becomes if you are in a state uh, that you can get an abortion on post, you're good to go. If you can't get it on your installation, you can get approved non-chargeable leave. You can get travel covered. Um, but if it is one of the abortions that is not approved by the federal government, so one that isn't because of rape or incest or um, the life of the mother, then you can take leave. Your commander is obligated to give you that leave, but you're going to have to pay out of pocket for all of the travel expenses. Yeah, so th those, as you said, those abortions that are covered right now, that's a, that's a really small set of what we're talking about, correct? It's a really small set, and it's also a... It's also the ones that are, you are able to get done in a military hospital, that's even rarer. Um, not every military treatment facility can accommodate them, and so what they have done in the past is just send people to private clinics off base. But if you are now in a place like Texas, um, where that's a little more complicated, or states particularly like Alabama, South Dakota, where there's no exception for rape or incest, then you're talking about sending people out of state on the military's dime to be able to do these procedures that are approved. And of course, this is this is a very personal uh, situation, personal decision. There's going to be women who don't want to talk to their commanders about this uh, and get their permission to go out. Right. And even in cases before where maybe you could have had the procedure done on your installation, maybe you don't want anyone in your chain of command to know because that will automatically show up in your medical records. So women who previously would have taken care of it themselves are no longer going to have that option. So Joe, I know this issue issue came up in the uh, debate over the House Appropriations Committee's um, uh, discussions over the budget for fiscal 2023. How, uh, a little bit of back and forth with Republicans, um, not much change though. How much of an issue do you think this becomes as we go into the defense budget season and into the authorization bill? Is this going to really stymie things? Well, the proposal that's in, that was included in the House Appropriations uh, bill that was drafted by Democrats um, would protect uh, or guarantee leave for uh, service members or DOD civilians um, who want to get uh, abortions and, uh, and request leave for them. Um, Republicans at the, at the uh, committee markup uh, disagreed with that and uh, signaled that it is going to be an issue for them. Um, I, I think with the, with the Supreme Court decision, I mean, we don't know how 
charged of an issue this is going to be, but I would assume that it is going to come up again. While we're on the defense budget, um, in recent weeks, we've seen four different top lines for defense spending next year. The Biden administration is looking at a 4% increase over current level spending. Uh, that's a big jump. But House appropriators are looking for a few billion above that. House Armed Services Committee came out with a proposal that's $37 billion above that. Senate Armed Services came out with a proposal that's $45 billion above that. Joe, what's going on with the defense budget? Where is it going to come in? Well, I think we can see that it's trending upward. I mean, that's a that's a fair. I think that's the that's a fair bet. Um, you know, Pentagon leaders said, um, you know, before we even started to see top lines from Congress that because of inflation, um, you know, they locked in their inflation numbers um, fairly early in the budget drafting process, and what they said was that they wanted to come back um, to Congress to increase the budget. So we knew that it was going to go up above Biden's request. What um, what they what they also said was that they didn't want um, lots more um, you know weapons and equipment um, than you know than what they had put in the budget, and that's what we're seeing. So at the same time, the Biden administration last year, when the defense budget was raised, didn't um, didn't push back too hard. The Pentagon and the budget. So. So I think we can we can see that it's going to go up. I don't, I don't think it surprises me. We see this every year. We see the administration come out with a budget proposal, and you get the push and pull, and Congress usually adds money to it. This is what we see. What's shocked me is just that that range at this point. You seem to have Democrats defending the Biden budget proposal, but then all the way up to this $45 billion plus up, and I don't, I don't have a good sense of where it could end up on that range. It could be a very significant increase, as you say, for inflation and other equipment, but the $45 billion that the Senate Armed Services put out is, is much more than inflation. It's a bunch of unfunded requirements. It's a handful of other uh, priorities they want. So, um, so I, it's, it'll, be, it'll be interesting. And now, one of the things that was included in the defense authorization bill uh, on both uh, the uh, House and the Senate side was um, some concerns about the Army combat fitness test. They're looking for a real overall here. What's, talk, talk a little bit about that. And what's the problem with these, these gender neutral standards that they're trying to work out for the military? So this most recent uh, push that lawmakers have made would create separate standards based on what your occupational specialty is. Um, you know, if you have an infantry job, you're in the cavalry, it's a lot more, it's a lot more physical, they want to have a higher standard of, of fitness for it. It's ironic because when this test was originally conceived, that is what the Army wanted, um, and they wanted it to be gender neutral and age neutral. The problem was is that the standards that they put out first were very hard for most women in the Army to meet. And so the Army decided to compromise and go back to having an age standard and a gender standard and not a job-focused standard. Um, that was also at the pushing of some lawmakers who were concerned about women failing. And so now that that has been completed and they've rolled out this test, there are lawmakers on the other side who are pushing back and saying this test isn't hard enough if you have a direct combat job. So now it seems like they're finally headed to a, a separate set of fitness tests, mm -hmm. which we've heard for years here. Folks who are, who are working in uh, you know, an office job, folks who are working in some sort of planning and logistics don't need the same requirements as folks who are going to be lugging heavy packs around, who are going to mm -hmm. be facing combat. So it seems like that's what they're going to. How, how tough is it going to be to get there? It depends on whether they want to have a separate fitness test or they just want to have sort of like a special standards within the standards, depending on your job, and then it can just be the same for everybody else. I don't really foresee them coming up with all sorts of new events and new modalities for the test. I think they're just going to tweak what kind of score everybody needs to but get. But the Army just started using this new test, mm -hmm. and now it looks like maybe they're not going to be using it for too long, or they'll be using modifications to it. And... Right, or they won't be doing tests for the record for yeah. another year. You know, it'll still all be in a piloting phase like it has been. No, it's a, it's, it's a lot of changes there. All right, finally for this week, before I let you both go, the 4th of July holiday is right around the corner. To help our viewers celebrate the holiday properly, uh, I want you both to recommend a good, realistic military movie that folks can watch. And before you answer, since I know you're already going to answer Independence Day from 1996. Why is that the greatest, most realistic military movie you've ever seen? I mean, I think despite, you know, what, whether aliens exist or not, if aliens came, I feel like that's probably pretty much how we'd handle it. We try like, to, we just try like to just throw bombs aliens. at things. That's how we handle it. We things. just had a whole hearing about how aliens exist, right? That was the, that was the, the House Intelligence Committee just, uh, just did one of those. So, yeah. Um, oh, my favorite. Um, my <laughs> You're going to give her an actual recommendation. Give an actual recommendation. Yeah, my actual recommendation. I, I love Apocalypse Now. Um, I don't know that. You, <laughs> I don't you know. feel like that's the kind of uplifting hey, thing. So. I'm just, it's a um, Vietnam War era classic. 
Um, and that's a, that's a great movie. Yeah, or if anyone wants to feel more triumphant, you know, We Were Soldiers is a good one. That, that, that'll make Absolutely. you feel nice. Right. I'm going to just go out, <laughs> go out and see the Top Gun sequel. The Top Gun Maverick. Oh, yeah. It's much more, it looks very nice and everything. So, all right, look, that's all the time we have this week. Thank you to both of, thanks to both of you for coming out today and for uh, giving us some more insight here. You can learn more about all the topics we discussed by visiting militarydimes.com. Thank you for watching and be careful with those backyard fireworks. Welcome to Earth. And that's all we have time for this week. Please visit us on militarytimes.com and defensenews.com for more coverage. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next week.